This is Andy Alspaugh from Duke University School of Medicine discussing systemic infections due to the yeast-like candida species. You recalled from the clinical microbiology lab that the blood cultures from one of your patients are growing a yeast. What is the meaning of this? Could this merely be a microbial contaminant of the culture? Do I need to start any new therapies tonight? You are very likely to receive this type of phone call numerous times as a clinician since yeasts are among the most common isolates from blood cultures. Therefore, in this lecture, we will explore serious infections due to a particular group of the fungal kingdom, the candida species. Frequently growing in a yeast-like form, candida species cause a range of conditions from superficial colonization to life-threatening disease. In this discussion of systemic candida infections, our learning objectives will be, first, to recognize the clinical factors that can predispose patients to these infections. Second, to consider the ways in which patients will present to their clinicians when experiencing systemic candida infections, and especially how to recognize serious complications of these infections. Third, we will define rational antifungal treatment strategies based on the specific candida species isolated. And fourth, all the while as thinking clinicians, we will consider what is known about the pathogenesis of these infections to better envision improved outcomes for our patients. Candida species can be normal inhabitants of the mouth, gut, and vaginal tract of healthy people. How then do these fungi enter the host and cause disease? Most commonly, this occurs through alterations in normal constitutive barriers of the skin and mucosal surfaces. IV catheters and wounds provide breaks in the skin through which microorganisms like candida can enter. Similarly, perforations of gastrointestinal tract include abdominal surgery, a ruptured viscous, or perhaps the GI mucosal disruption that occurs during cancer chemotherapy. All of these provide entry sites for the movement of microbes from normal commensal locations to deeper tissues. We also know that the microorganisms in your microbiota continually compete and interact with each other. However, major changes in the microbial flora, such as those that occur when we take antibiotics, can lead to an increased growth of non-bacterial species, such as candida. This is one of the main reasons, for instance, that women can develop vaginal yeast infections after taking antibiotics. Finally, specific forms of immunosuppression can lead to systemic candida infections. And interestingly, our AIDS patients rarely develop candidemia even in the face of severe mucosal disease such as esophageal candidiasis. However, patients with neutropenia, especially after chemotherapy, are at high risk for candida bloodstream infections and secondary complications. One of the most common and serious forms of systemic candidiasis is candidemia, or a bloodstream infection due to candida species. When this condition is recognized, the first thing that you should consider is the source of the infection, examining the patient from head to toe for those predisposing factors I just mentioned, such as IV catheters, wounds, or alterations of the GI tract. Second, after thinking about the source of candidemia, you must be vigilant for secondary complications. Once candida gets into the bloodstream, where might it end up and cause serious host damage? One of the most important considerations is whether there is involvement of the posterior parts of the eye, a condition known, to, known as endophthalmitis. The figure on the right side of this slide demonstrates a retinal photo of a patient with white spots characteristic of this metastatic infection. Because the identification of candida endophthalmitis often directs your therapy, a detailed retinal examination should be a routine part of the assessment of every patient with candidemia. Now, although candida species can cause meningitis as a complication of bloodstream infection, this typically occurs in neonates or other patients who do not have an intact or fully mature blood-brain barrier. Unlike primary neuropathogens such as Cryptococcus neoformans or Neisseria meningitidis, Candida does not appear to have a major tropism for the central nervous system. Candida species can also cause serious ur urinary tract infections. 
These can arise as an ascending infection from the lower urinary tract. Alternatively, the kidneys can be directly affected from the bloodstream. Now, one confusing detail for early clinicians is that candida is most often seen in urine cultures as a contaminant rather than a true pathogen. So what I mean is this. Candida species are frequent colonizers of indwelling ur urinary catheters, and they can also be contaminants of an improperly collected urine specimen, given their role as a frequent vaginal colonizer. Therefore, most urine cultures grown in candida will, will represent contaminated cultures rather than a true fungal urinary tract infection. So how do I tell the difference? It's not always easy. However, a few clues will lead you toward the appropriate therapy. First, are there white blood cells present in the urine indicative of inflammation and infection? Does the patient have UTI symptoms? Is the patient immunocompromised? And is there a deep urinary tract prosthesis present, such as a ureteral stent or nephrostomy tubes? All of these may predispose in, uh, toward treatment. There's a very unique form of systemic candidiasis that most often occurs in neutropenic patients. Referred to as hepatosplenic candidiasis, this condition is characterized by a very uh, low-grade form of candidemia. This can therefore be missed unless serial blood cultures are performed. Now, these patients will often present during the period of recovery from neutropenia with fevers and perhaps fungal microabscesses of organs such as the liver and the spleen as demonstrated in this abdominal CT image of a patient who indeed is recovering from cancer chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. Candida species will very often be isolated from respiratory cultures, likely due to their frequent colonization of the mouth and upper respiratory tract. However, candida pneumonias are exceedingly rare, and when candida is seen in respiratory cultures, an alternative etiology should strongly be considered. Given these clinical syndromes, what are the symptoms that patients with systemic candidiasis will have as they present to medical care, especially with candidemia? High fevers are very characteristic of this infection. Additionally, patients can frequently experience hemodynamic instability and even frank shock due to candidemia, similar to the sepsis syndrome due to bacteremias with staph or gram-negative rods. If this infection becomes localized to a particular anatomic site, the patient will have symptoms referable to that particular infection, be it urinary symptoms from kidney or bladder infection, visual changes from retinal involvement, or other organ-specific symptoms as listed here. Lastly, how do we make a specific diagnosis of a systemic infection due to candida species? These fungi are most frequently isolated in standard blood cultures. However, as mentioned previously, sometimes this isolation requires repeated blood sampling. Now, organ-specific signs can be pursued by biopsy of the infect affected region and the organism demonstrated by either culture or histopathology. As in many conditions, experienced clinicians remain vigilant for this syndrome and high-risk patients, such as those in intensive care units, uh, patients with IV catheters in place, uh, patients with alterations of GI integrity, and especially in highly immunocompromised patients, such as those with neutropenia.